picture if those tracks Why you always gotta pick riff tracks It's your lucky day, it's time for riff tracks Hello, I'm Faith, and welcome to Faith's Take, where I talk about anything and everything that I find interesting. And welcome to episode 20 of Every Rift Track Short Reviewed, where I take five Rift Track Shorts in chronological order, review them, and give them a rating between 1 and 5, with the points being good, great, awesome, fantastic, and spectacular, because I don't think a bad Rift Track Short exists. After 20 episodes of this show, we're still going strong, and each short here is absolutely hilarious. We'll also be getting to the 100th Rift Trek short ever made today, so let's dive right in with episode 20 of Every Rift Trek Short Reviewed. Number 96, Mealtime Manners and Health, from July 8th, 2010. Hello? Oh, hello! Oh, hello, hello, hello! What? H hello? Ah, mealtime manners. Did you know that your table manners can greatly affect your health? Well, that's what this short from our friends at Coronet are telling us anyway. Meet Phil, a fifth grader who becomes obsessed with his mealtime manners. He decides that by developing this extremely specific set of skills, his entire life will improve. And then against all odds, this actually proves to be true. Let's have a nice gray lunch. They are the ways we express thoughtfulness of others. Young Brad Garrett says, agrees. Please and thank you, and thinks he has good manners. But this four-year-old puts him to shame. But is, or is there something more to good manners at meal time? I'm going to guess that you think there is, narrator. Mrs. Johnson supervises the cafeteria. But not the people or activities inside it. Just the room. <laughs> she wants them to take their trays and eat with the younger children. She chooses four from Phil's table. But not Phil. Why not? Because Phil is Phil Italian and Mrs. Johnson doesn't. loathes Italians. Mrs. Johnson chose Phil's classmates for a very good reason. Not Italian. Later, Phil plotted revenge on Mrs. Johnson for that having evening, insulted Phil's his family his out. On. <coughs> Italian. He, <coughs> he was all wrapped up in his own thoughts. Limited his as they were. Special... He hoped he could get into the house and to his own room without being noticed. But that lousy Potter kid had borrowed his invisibility cloak and never gave it back. Phil was too much concerned about his own problem to think about his mother or his family. His parents' will was adjusted accordingly the very next could day. He be so th Some of the scenes we saw last week, which showed the importance of a balanced diet, were blatantly false, yet you believed us like sheep. <laughs> As time goes on, Phil turns everything around. Not only do these mealtime manners improve his health, they improve his daily life. Yes, apparently you don't just need to use your mealtime manners at mealtime. No, that makes too much sense. You can use mealtime manners at any time of the day. Does that completely defeat the purpose of calling these mealtime manners instead of just manners and confirm that this whole short was just a scheme from Cornette to get kids to be more polite all the time? Indeed it does, but that doesn't deter Phil any. Each one of us, when we sit down to eat with other people, should try to make it as cheerful and pleasant for other people as we can. In Phil's case, that means wearing a paper bag over his head. And that good mealtime manners are important to health. Whereas bad manners cause cancer. He was careful to get home in plenty of time for supper. Except on Chitlin's night. He even enjoyed helping with Cindy, his baby sister. Whose existence he had previously refused to acknowledge. Found he was ready to eat. Hungry, but relaxed just feeling good and enjoying the mealtime with his family. Until 15 seconds later when father announced he was running off with his secretary. The little courtesies, such as passing food that once seemed hard, seemed easy now. Breathing, once a hellish ordeal, was now simple. Phil's fa Phil found he now liked to practice such courtesies as passing things before they were asked for. He began eating his vegetables before they were grown. Easy. This lasts even after the meal. Mealtime manners consumed every facet of Phil's life. <laughs> yes, Phil, people do notice good manners. Good mealtime manners, which can evidently occur any time. Yes, Phil has changed, and he knows it. He hates what but he's he become. Sure anyone... This kind of, sort of, maybe not really lesson gets a four out of five. Yeah, huh? imagine that. Well, what the hell do you mean by that, you little snot nosed fruit? Come on, Kevin, your mealtime manners. My what? Ah, I wasn't paying attention! <laughs> Number 97, Things Are Different Now, from July 22nd, 2010. Your father stopped by. He did? To tell you how glad he is he left. Is that something you want to... 
Time for a nice little dose of depression. Joey is adjusting to his parents' recent divorce, and the pain is still hitting him pretty hard. He becomes increasingly touchy and begins lashing out against his mom, grandfather, and even best friend. Joey's so hurt by his dad's decision to leave, he can't even call him to talk things out. Uh, thank you, Steve. No one told you to stand up and sing. Can't read my poker, my mama poker face. <laughs> yeah. Why can't things just be like they used to? Please refer to the title. And Joey looks in for the sign, just as his father looked for signs from his secretary. Just a bit outside, just as Joey's father got a little loving outside his own marriage. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Just leave me alone. I just feel like you're a little divorced from reality. I, I mean, maybe your your shoulder is separated. I mean, perhaps if you threw a shattered home life, I, I mean, slider, slider. What's bugging you, man? You are. Well, you better watch your mouth. And you better watch yours. You sing like a girl, and you sing like a monkey. Don't sing like a monkey. Why, you? I wish there was some hook, some obvious flaw about you that I could latch onto. You better run if I ever catch you to be sorry. I swear to God, I'll cut you open, fry your innards, and eat them in front of you as you slowly die. Oh, dear, this is so sad that he has a rotary phone. Yeah. I miss you. Still, I'm paying tribute to you by sitting around in my filthy bathrobe and acting really pathetic. Joey, it's your father. Do you want to talk to him? No speaky English. And so Joey planted a garden of pain and watered it with his own tears. Thankfully, while the subject here is unpleasant, the riffs are great, and as usual, Mike, Kevin, and Bill are here to keep us all in a good mood. And the short picks up by the end. After talking things out with his grandfather and facing his friend again, Joey begins to feel better and learns that sometimes you just have to adjust to your changing circumstances and make the best of what you have. His you Does My like Dad Love Me survey is not turning out like he expected. He actually instructed me to shoot you with rock salt if I ever saw you. Yep, kids in the 70s were nuts for doo-wop. I got a job. Oh, no, why he, he, he got cold. himself a job. He's walking with mom down oh, the street. He, he, walking he's and talking with mom. Shot. All right. <laughs> what? Well, I have something to discuss. For your information, young man, we came here to fish. Ah, happy times, <laughs> arguing with grandpa. Can you keep a secret? Well, I reckon I can. Got a 20? Sometimes when they be fighting, I try to think of this word. A magic word. Quality? Those Freshness? Like flavor? Grandpa went off his meds again. He better, he better, he better die. Get out of here! Golden Corral opens at four. Don't be late, Chubbs. You better start running. Or else what? Ooh, he wasn't ready for that comeback. Funny part of this is how quickly it accelerates into a Kill Bill-style knife fight. And now I understand the message of this film. It's a 16-minute commercial for Tide. You had enough. You feel better. Mostly confused. How'd you know? I felt like that on my own. Man. Your dad left? Or actually, he hired another son. You never told me. You know, I never thought you were divorced. I'm not. My parents are. Ah, oh, well met, sir. Touche. Do you ever no. get over it? Unbeknownst to his mom, Joey was married and had a family and a house on the other side of town. In fact, he was a successful architect and a member of the Rotary Club. Hi, Dad. Why are you wearing that dress? Rolling down the street, smoking Indos, sipping on gin and juice, laid back. Got my mind and my money and my money and my... Ah! Glory, glory. Yeah, Grandpa has a gospel song for every occasion. Song for composting is particularly inspiring. Amazing waste? Yeah. Yeah, a morose short with a hopeful ending, this one gets a four and a half out of five. Joey's glory, glory. Hallelujah! Joey's dad has just split the sea. Real sensitive. Kid. <laughs> Number ninety-eight, Williams Doll, from August fifth, two thousand ten. You're not gonna leave me, are you, William? 
That's more like it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, 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 wait. You take me with you, or there will be a world of pain. We are bound in darkness now, and there is no escape. You wanted this! Yeah! Once upon a time, there was a boy named William. At first alone. glance, William seems like a normal little boy. But upon further inspection, I am 100% certain William will grow up to be a serial killer. You see, William meets his new neighbor, a little baby named Melissa, and he begins to fondle said infant. The adults just watch charmed by this frightening display. Let's just be thankful William hasn't hit puberty yet, or this would be even worse. After this incident, I think most of us would come to one of two conclusions. Either A, William needs severe therapy sessions, or B, William deeply longs for a sibling. Unfortunately, the short doesn't explore either option, and just decides that what William really needs is a doll. Get ready, get set, go! Winner gets to advance to the fourth grade! Pretend to know my dreams and wishes and be my little friend. Kids, if a man in the park sings that he wants you to be his little friend, the phrase is stranger danger. The school's dismissed until they can find the creepy folk singer hiding in the air ducts and smoke him out. Make sure those reports are on my desk in the morning, okay? He's a sweet kid. I, I should introduce her to Frank from my church. Hey, Dad! I want to race to school today. Hey, you love me now? Oh. Hi. And this is Melissa. Yikes, what an a-hole. Aw, oh, that's sweet. He wants to play with the baby. Kids are so cute when they start to act like, uh... Hmm. Hey, what the... Somebody stop him. No, this is... Oh my god, I'm gonna puke. This is weird. Just then, Woody Allen shows up with a bouquet of flowers, but turns away in tears. He starts work immediately on a new house to share with his bride, baby Melissa. Oops, just lost one of my baby teeth. Baby teeth? Can I hold it? You're right, Dolly. Michelle is kind of a gross mess. Ah. William is well on his way to being the first eight-year-old that has to inform the neighbors when he moves to town. It just gets worse from here as we see William on his birthday. This kid only has two friends outside of his dad and grandfather, which is pretty unsurprising given what we just witnessed. After his party, William confides in his grandpa about his wishes for a doll, and his grandpa takes him to get him one. When William's dad isn't happy with William getting a doll, Grandpa tries to give some poetic spiel about love and how if you don't let kids play with dolls, they'll somehow become hardened, loveless freaks. But here's a better idea. Maybe if you showed your kid affection, they wouldn't have to rely on their playthings to get it. Hey, Gramps is coming for your birthday. He wants to know what you want. Or he'll just give you his old National Geographics again. Could I have a doll? A doll? Uh, dolls are for girls. How about a football helmet? That's for boys. Or a red goofy hat. That's mature and respectable. Oh, Grandpa, your hair is more clown-like than ever. And this time make it something that isn't way outside the boundaries of all known cultural, religious, and societal norms. Hey, I wish that baby had been here to see that. Something is amusing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, non-specific stuff is funny. Hey, hey, don't ever touch that stick! That is my stick! There! Now your stick's in hell! Are you still awake? Yeah, but for the last time, I will not tuck you in, Gramps. I, I just don't think it's appropriate. But there's something else, isn't there? For some reason you just snapped my pinky finger in two. I, I kind of wanted a doll. Yep, I stormed the beaches of Normandy so you could have a doll, sure. <laughs> I just want a doll. And I'm gonna keep snapping fingers till I get it. Great, I'll eat it here. How about a little sugar for the enlightened grandpa, huh, sweetie? Oh, my God, he's burying it alive. See, never ever give a boy a doll. They become serial killers. Is it any different for William to express his emotions to a Raggedy Andy, a teddy bear, or a doll? Or an eggplant, for example? Son, kids are born with a lot of love inside them. Look at William. His love disgusts me. I will snuff it out. Much love. Yeah. Something wrong with showing affection. Well, you stop doing it. After a while, you forget how. Like me, but hell, Maybe. I've forgotten everything. His children. 
your grandchildren, Mark, are going to be very lucky because William has a doll. They can sell it to some collector who lives with nine cats. Weirdos pay good money for crappy old toys. Uh, buying himself a doll. A short that's as creepy as it is hilarious, this one's a classic, and I've got to give it a five out of five. <laughs> Jeez, with the huge yeah, pink okay, flowers, God. how did you expect the kid to turn crazy. out? Okay. Number 99, Decisions Decisions from August 9th, 2010. It all started at the end of the summer when my family moved here from Salt Lake. Leaving Salt Lake City? Always a good decision. In our lives, we'll face many situations where we need to make tough decisions. This is one of those situations that Tommy finds himself in. After his family moves onto a farm during the summer, he meets Joey, the local weirdo. Unbeknownst to Tommy, all the other kids in town hate Joey. Of course, Tommy takes the side of his new friend, that is, until school starts. That's when he realizes that Joey separates himself on purpose and may actually be a sociopath. We had a barn and everything, and I really wanted a horse. My parents said it was okay, but I had to earn the money to buy it. Because they knew there was no way in hell that would ever happen. Here it comes! I've come on! Joey was named the Oakland Raiders starting quarterback later that day. Pizza for Tommy, allergy medicine for Joey. My family's gonna go to my grandma's and eat from sometime this fall. And my mom said you could go with us. Oh gee, cancel the Disney my, World my trip, Ma. My grandma needs a chicken coop painted and she said she'd pay us $20 each if we did a good job. When in the fall, Joey? Well, sometime in October, probably. That's prime coop painting season. He's got lots of apple trees. I could fix some. We can bring you back all you want. Can I go, Mom? Can you go? We can always use the apples, you know. You could? How many apples a day are you going through? Girl. What do you want to do now? Eat some hay or... I know. Let's sell paper airplanes. Fortunately, I always carry a spare ream of paper in my back pocket. Can I throw it? Sure. Throw it hard. Joey somehow lodges it up his own nose. Hey, stupid! Try and spook my horse! Do you know those guys, Joey? That's yeah, a Malfoy yeah, kid. But I... You call us dumb. You're the stupid one. Oh, your Be verbal your jape has bested me, sir. When school started, I found out nobody liked Joey. Our math teacher, Mr. Mead, was a huge dick to Joey. No don't play, Joey! I don't want to play things dumb friends is. Have it your way, sir. And what language are you speaking, by the way? Day by day, though, I noticed that Joey never tried to make friends with anybody. It was almost like he wanted to be different. He always loudly talked about how he'd never seen The Wire. Tommy becomes ridiculously conflicted. If he hangs out with Joey, he can go do chores for Joey's grandma's farm and make some money, but becomes a social leper. If he goes and hangs out with the other kids instead, he risks Joey snapping and killing him in his sleep. Unfortunately, Tom isn't sure what's more important, more friends or his own financial security. He goes to his heavily drugged mother to get some advice. You'd think this would all lead up to his final decision, but guess what? In the end, we don't get to see his decision at all! Yup, this whole thing meant absolutely nothing! I started hanging around with Bill and Chad. They were really nice guys, but they didn't like Joey either. They really nicely said he was worse than cancer. Mom, you tell him I gotta work and can't go out. I'm not gonna lie for you, son. Oh, Tommy! I'm too full of Valium and coconut rum. You better go, Tommy. Hey, Tommy, your mailman came, but he saw me and ran the other way. We're gonna call Grandma tonight. You can go, can't ya? Grandma won't let me come unless I bring I a cooler know. friend. I'll have to go talk it over with Mom and Dad. That's the ticket, yeah. My mom and dad are Elizabeth Taylor and an astronaut. Yeah, that's it. I don't know if I want to go to Joey's grandma's. I don't know if I want to file well, her calluses. No one likes He doesn't try to make friends with anybody, and he does dumb things. Also, it seems we have our own coop to paint right well, here. Tommy, if it's the apples you're worried about, <laughs> please don't. We could use them, but... We don't need them. We'll make it through the winter without those but precious apples, about probably. That money you're I think that the most important thing is that you think everything out really carefully. And keep yourself sedated at all times so life seems bearable. There were just 
You balance the goods and the bads both ways. Then count the mediums and, and divide them by the sideways. Then happened. take a two-day nap. And how you learn to make decisions you can live with. If you're not careful, you could wind up cleaning a chicken coop you hate with a son you never wanted. I kept trying to balance the goods and the bads of going with Joey. And the pros and cons of using the It'd phrase goods and bads. Bucks, but it would be hard work. Even Mom's special prison gruel couldn't cheer me up. I didn't... Hey, Tommy, not so fast. Whatever you say, gay southern dad. <coughs> Mom told me about your problem, the decision you have to make. And I hate it when she talks to me, so make up your mind. This anticlimactic short gets a four out of five. I guess I thought if I just didn't see him, he wouldn't ask me to go. And I wouldn't have to decide. Later, the grocer asked Tommy, paper or plastic, and he curled up in a ball. So many of the guys... Number 100, Library World, from August 12, 2010. Well, it's okay to talk in the library, but there are other people here trying to study, so you want to keep the noise down. Keep the what the down? Let's all go to the library. According to this short, it's the best place ever. We open with a couple of kids headed toward the park, but they need to stop at the library first to drop off a book. Blondie here thinks the library sucks until he sees this obvious dweeb who works there. He inexplicably finds this guy cool, and it turns out he works at the library. So this kid won't trust his friend about how great the library is, and he'll believe an absolute stranger just because he has a cool car. Hey Stephanie, how'd you like to go to the park for baseball? That'd be great, but I gotta take this book to the library today. And it takes well, 11 hours to return a book. How about... On the stingray, heading down to Library World with my dumb blonde friend. Library World is filmed before a live audience. <laughs> Gah, a 70s hipster. Right. Careful, he may go off about what technically precise musicians Steely Dan are. I don't know how doors work. Wow, he works there. My mind is blown. Hello? Hold on a minute. I'm looking at a new display. Are you interested in the Civil War? The what? Yeah. Kinda. Is that a real rifle? Not only is this a real rifle, this was used in the Civil War. In fact, it's loaded. Find out more? There's lots to learn about in the library. Shh. With a little imagination, everything comes Shh. to life. Shh. We're coming up to the books on the Civil War now. Right here. Check out the carnage. Oh, oh my god! Oh. <laughs> the kid's brand new best friend shows them around the whole library and tells them that you can find literally anything you can imagine in the library. From books which you need a convoluted system to find, to music and movies, you can find it all in your local library. Here's a book on animals right here. Ah, help! I've been hurled into the heart of darkness! That is all right! He was Jake Lloyd's acting coach for The Phantom Menace. <laughs> Why, there's the novelization of Manos, The Hands of Fate. I learned to fly a 747 at the library. Thanks to the library, I can control the weather. The desperate search for M. Night Shyamalan's career. The library card's one of the most valuable things you've got. Having fun isn't hard when you've got a library card. The books aren't just thrown together, they're grouped together by subjects and labeled with numbers. Let me show you what I mean. Oh, when sure. Can you tell me how to fix a broken heart? Huh, Stanley? What well, can you? Cards. It does say almost everything, Mike, On to be one fair. Card, you we write this the time, title of the book Schuller. and the book's number. We have only two cards. On one, we write the title of the book. And which studio has optioned it? Where do you write the book's number? With fiction, we don't use numbers. What? The books are put on the shelf in alphabetical order by the author's last name. Melville oh, Dewey must be rolling in his grave! This drawer's brother had a memorable cameo in Ghostbusters. That's this number in the upper left-hand corner. Write that down. I could easily memorize it. It's just five numbers. Write it down! Oh, okay. Let me show you a really neat article on flight. It's in highlights. Goofus wrote it himself. Wow. Beavis and Butthead visit the library. We also have old magazines, so you can find out things from the past. Or we even have newspapers in the library. Honestly, kids, we pretty much take and display any box of crap people leave at our doorstep. 
This is the microfilm machine, which allows us to look at newspapers from the past. What about newspaper from the future? From over 50 years ago. <laughs> I kid. We don't have room newspapers in the newspaper. future. So over here we've got an entire library of films. Ooh, let's watch Library World. I'll show you a real funny one. It's called Requiem for a Dream. Please, they want us to believe a public library would have such a recent up-to-date film? Out of my way, I've got a damsel to run over. This dorky short gets a four out of five. The children would find out later that the boy who helped them had died three years ago that very day. We've done it, guys. Gone through 100 Rift Track shorts. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a special thank you to all of my incredible Patreon supporters. And special shoutouts to Kevin Nata and Jill Johnson for their extremely generous donations. Please check out my page and see if any of the rewards float your boat. Now, I've been working really hard on the next few videos. I'll finally be getting my review of the next Season 1 episode of MST3K out, and I have a very special review coming up. This month, we not only have the premiere of Season 11 of MST3K, but April 16th is the one-year anniversary of my channel. So in honor of these occasions, I'll finally be reviewing the Rift Treks Live MST3K reunion show, which is what started all of this craziness in the first place. Once again, thank you so much for everything, and I'll see you guys later.